Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Scott Kuykendall, and I'm the Water Resources Specialist for McHenry County. I help oversee our scientific research on uh, water resource issues. I help set public policy. I help maintain our environmental compliance with the IEPA. And then I do public education and outreach like this. Uh, in McHenry County, we have uh, very great water resources. What we have here is really pretty special, and it deserves to be protected. Uh, we have developed a water resources action plan to help communities and uh, residents and others to protect our water resources, and so we'll be talking about that tonight. Uh, our outline for the presentation tonight is we'll start out talking about water resources in general, then we'll start narrowing in and talking about water resources specific to McHenry County. We'll then go over the parts of the uh, Water Resources Action Plan. The presentation is about 30 minutes long, and then we'll have a question and answer period afterwards. So we've got a lot to cover, so we'll go ahead and get started. So we live on a blue planet where most of the planet is uh, covered with water. However, most of that water is uh, salt water, oceans. Only about 2.5% of the water on the planet, that includes all the water in the atmosphere, on the ground, and in the earth, is fresh water. And most of that fresh water is ice. So about 70% of our fresh water is locked up in the ice caps. And as that melts, it goes down into the oceans and becomes salt water. Uh, most of the remaining uh, fresh water is actually inaccessible. It's either too deep, it's in the atmosphere, or it's not clean enough to use. Uh, so really, only about 0.007% of all the water on the planet is available for us to use. And we have to share that water with a lot of other species and a lot of other people. So there's currently about 7 billion people on the planet. When my parents were born, there was about 2.4 billion uh, people on the planet. Within their single lifetime, we've gone from 2.4 billion people to over 7 billion people, and we're rapidly approaching 9 billion people on the planet, all needing to share that 0.007% of water on the, fresh water on the planet. And unfortunately, our actions are adversely impacting that 0.007%. And water is necessary for all living things, whether you live in the Arctic, the tropics, or the Midwest. Water is necessary for all life. And because water is necessary for all life, it's also necessary for all economic development. You know, people are not going to invest in homes or businesses if they don't have access to safe, clean, reliable, and affordable water resources. And water is scarce in much of the planet. Uh, it's estimated by uh, 2025 that two-thirds of the world's uh, population will live under water stress, and almost two billion people will live in absolute water scarcity. That means from one day to the next, almost two billion people will have no idea if they're gonna have access to water that day. Fortunately, here in McHenry County, we do have safe, sustainable supplies of water, but that's only true if we protect them. So this is a map of uh, distribution of water in Illinois. Uh, we get most of our drinking water from groundwater, lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. Uh, you can see up in the northeast corner of the state that uh, we've got a lot more water compared to the uh, rest of the state down south. Uh, most of the water up in that northeast corner is uh, water drawn from Lake Michigan, shown in blue. Uh, you'll also see a lot of brown in that area, and that's uh, water that's drawn from groundwater resources. Uh, throughout the rest of the state, most of the blue areas that you see are reservoirs. So those are man-made water bodies that were created by damming up rivers or streams. And without those impoundments, much of southern Illinois, or much of the rest of Illinois, will look pretty dry compared to the northeast corner. So this is a map closing in on the Chicagoland region. Uh, and uh, once again, the areas shown in blue are uh, communities that get their water from Lake Michigan. Uh, you've got various shades of brown, and those are communities get, that get their water from groundwater resources. And then there are communities uh, uh, that get their water from uh, the Fox River or a combination of Fox River and groundwater. And uh, so we've got a variety of sources. Uh, one thing to point out, though, is that uh, most of the collar counties around Chicago uh, up into the 80s were actually on groundwater, too. It was only sent from the 80s on that uh, most of the communities around Chicago converted to Lake Michigan water. And if anything ever happens to Lake Michigan, it'll be very difficult for them to go back into groundwater now. So it's imperative that we take care of Lake Michigan as a resource uh, to, for the betterment of everybody in the, in the region. This is a cross-sectional view of our subsurface geology and aquifers. Uh, so the uppermost layer is a land uh, layer of sand and gravel. Uh, this is material that was brought in as the glaciers came down and receded, it came down and receded. So they brought with them silts, sediments, and a lot of sand and gravel. 
So when it rains or snow melts, water is able to infiltrate down through the sand and gravel layer, fill the pore spaces between the sand and gravel particles, and create a water table. We're then able to drill down below that water table to use water for our own use. Below the sand and gravel layer is a layer of limestone or dolomite, and this is hard, rigid rock that doesn't hold water by itself. But there are cracks and fissures in the uh, limestone, and water is able to infiltrate down through the sand and gravel, fill the voids and cracks and fissures in the limestone, and then we can drill down and use that as our aquifer. Uh, below that are layers of uh, sandstone. Uh, we've got three different sandstone aquifers. The uppermost one is a St. Peter's aquifer, and uh, the uh, area that we get water from in that St. Peter's is recharged largely in uh, western McHenry County, uh, where uh, the uh, impermeable layers uh, get thin enough so water can pass through down into that uh, St. Peter's sandstone, or in Boone County, where they have what are called deep bedrock valleys that, that uh, go from the land surface all way down to the sandstone so water is able to infiltrate down and recharge the St. Peter's. Uh, the main aquifer that we use uh, in the deep bedrock is the uh, Ironton Galesville and that's actually recharged up in north central Wisconsin so it can take a thousand or thousands of years for a molecule of water to hit the ground up there, infiltrate down to the water table and then make its way towards us. So if we're taking water out faster than it's coming towards us, the water table drops. And then we've got the Mount Simon Aquifer, which is the lowest uh, uh, sandstone aquifer in our area. Uh, it's not used uh, readily for water, uh, potable water, because it's very saline. Uh, but there may be opportunities for uh, uh, using that for drinking water in some parts of the state, including underneath McHenry County, where the layer of fresh water is a bit thicker. Uh, it's not a great resource, but it's something that uh, may be considered in the future. These are maps showing the distribution of our different aquifers in the state. And once again, you can see up in northern, uh, northern Illinois and northeastern Illinois specifically, we have access to multiple aquifers that the rest of the state does not have. Uh, so we really are very fortunate to have these resources. This is a close-up view of McHenry County. Uh, so it's showing the different uh, sources of water for different communities in McHenry County. The dark brown uh, communities are communities that rely solely on deep bedrock aquifers. The light colored uh, areas uh, are communities that uh, rely so solely on sand and gravel aquifers. And then the medium yellowish uh, color uh, is, uh, are areas that rely on a combination of deep and shallow aquifers. So this is a map showing the extent of the sandstone aquifers in the Midwest and I uh, show where the recharge area for the Ironton Galesville is in McHenry County. So once again, if water is uh, being taken out faster than it's coming down towards us, the water table drops. And that is exactly what's happening. So this is a map uh, showing the sandstone aquifer uh, and the desaturated areas uh, in the region. So the area shown in the darkest red uh, are areas in Will County and Joliet where the, they have dropped the water table by over 800 feet. That creates what's called a Kona depression. So it drops the water table and that water table drop create, is out, goes out in a cone shape. And it extend, that cone shape extends underneath McHenry County. So the desaturation in uh, Joliet area is actually affecting us up in uh, southeast corner of uh, McHenry County too. Uh, Joliet is actually running out of water and is in the process of uh, uh, building a pipeline to take water from Lake Michigan all the way out to Joliet. So it's going to cost about a billion dollars to uh, create it, about a billion dollars to operate it, and people's water bills are going to go from about $30 a month to over $100 a month. So these are very real issues and uh, we need to be very careful not to overdraw our water supplies. And uh, these are maps that were put together uh, from the Illinois State Water Survey, and they show uh, areas in McHenry County that are at risk. So the uh, yellowish colors are areas that uh, are at risk, and uh, the dark red is uh, forecasted out into 2050. If we continue on the same track, then we are uh, going to have hot spots that are in greater danger of, uh, of not being able to meet their water supply with the sandstone aquifers. And Daniel Abrams is with the Illinois State Water Survey, and he's their lead modeler who has been working on the deep aquifers uh, for Will County, and he'll be giving a presentation later this uh, evening, and he'll go into greater detail detail on the study. So since we can't keep taking more and more water out of the deep 
bedrock aquifer, we're going to have to rely more and more on our sand and gravel aquifers. And uh, this is a profile view showing what uh, sand and gravel aquifers might look like. Uh, it is not a uniform layer of sand and gravel across the county. Uh, it is a hodgepodge of materials that were brought down as the glaciers came down and receded, came down and receded. So uh, Jason Thomason with the Illinois State Geological Survey uh, has described it to me as being a beautiful, complicated mess. And uh, it is a, a, a very complex area. You can't just look at the ground level and understand what's going on. So we've done a lot of studies to better understand what's going on underground. Uh, we may have areas that have multiple sand, uh, sand and gravel aquifers. Uh, and so this uh, shows the different uh, types of aquifers we may have. And you can also see that there are layers of uh, material between some of those aquifers. Those are referred to as aquitards. So they may be silts and clays that limit water's ability to infiltrate downward. And uh, so those areas may have slower uh, recharge, uh, but those areas may also limit the amount of pollutants that can come down. So Amy Gahala is with the U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, she will be talking more about our sand and gravel aquifers in her presentation this evening. So just like we can uh, desaturate our deep sandstone aquifers, we can also desaturate our sand and gravel aquifers. So these are maps from a study that the Illinois State Water Survey did for, the state, uh, for McHenry County, and it shows areas that have been desaturated in McHenry County. Uh, so the uh, uh, left panel is showing uh, desaturation uh, in 2009. And uh, this is for the Ashmore uh, aquifer, which is the middle aquifer on the previous panel. Uh, and if we continue the way we're going, uh, by 2050, the desaturation will be even greater, especially in the Woodstock area. So we need to be very careful not to desaturate both our deep aquifers and our shallow aquifers. And so all of our water bodies and our land uses are interconnected. So all of our groundwater aquifers, whether the sand and gravel aquifers, the limestone aquifers, or the sandstone aquifers, are interconnected with our uh, water resources, whether they're lakes, rivers, streams, or wetlands. And uh, those are interconnected with our uh, natural areas, whether they're savanna, uh, prairie, wetland, and those are interconnected with our built environment. So whether there are charming towns or our uh, productive farms or our fun festivities, all of these things are hydrologically connected. So this is an animated slide showing natural hydrology. So when it rains or snow melts, water infiltrates down through the ground and recharges our water table. But it's not just moving downward, it's also moving sideways. So in a matter of days, weeks, months, years, or decades, that water is moving down and sideways and providing a base flow of cool, clean water to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. And uh, so uh, it's uh, just a constant flow of groundwater that's maintaining that water level. In an urbanized area uh, where we've paved over, uh, the, the ground, water is no longer able to infiltrate down. So it hits the ground surface and rushes off, carrying with it any pollutants that it comes in contact with along the way. So basically anything we put into the air or onto the land can be collected by stormwater as it moves down. And it rushes down to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands with hot, dirty water creating a flood stage, followed by drought, flood, drought, flood, drought. So we've created very extreme hydrologic uh, situations as opposed to a natural basin flow of cool, clean water coming through natural hydrology. And so what we really are trying to do now is we're trying to restore that natural hydrology to our built environment to put water back into the ground and maintain that base flow to our natural uh, water bodies. So our water resources are vulnerable to a wide variety of threats. The four main ones we look at are overconsumption. So if we're taking more water out than is naturally being recharged, and then the water table drops down. Uh, if we pave over everything, water is no longer able to infiltrate down and recharge our water table. And then drought. During periods of drought, we're not getting the uh, recharge. So water uh, keeps drawing down further and further. And one of the ironic or sad things is that during periods of drought, we uh, actually accelerate our water use. Whether it's for watering lawns or irrigating crops, we can use up to 50% more water during periods of drought than during normal times. 
and then pollution. Like I said, anything we put into the air, onto the land, or even into the ground uh, can be sources of pollution for our water resources. Fortunately, McHenry County has uh, done more to understand and protect our water resources than any other county in the state. We have been an absolute leader in water resources, and that's one of the main reasons I took this job, is because we take water seriously, and we've done a good job uh, uh, researching and protecting our water resources. So starting in 2006, we did our first major study of water resources with our groundwater resources management plan. And so this looked at both our water supplies and demands that were currently uh, there and then future demands. Uh, and uh, the study uh, identified potential for groundwater depletion and groundwater contamination. And at that time, we were experiencing explosive growth. So there was very big concern that we wouldn't have enough water to support that growth. And that's still an issue. Even though we've had this downturn, we fully expect uh, population growth and development to continue on into the future. This has just kind of been a blip uh, in, our, in our growth. So the county board was very concerned about uh, the groundwater management plan uh, and asked for a second plan to be done. So whereas the first one focused on the problems, the water resources action plan focuses on solutions. And a lot of really great things came out of this uh, original water resources action plan. So one of the first things that was done is we worked with the Illinois State Geological Survey to develop a network of monitoring wells distributed throughout the entire county. Uh, so these wells are monitoring water levels in real time. So every 15 minutes, it's taking a water level measurement. It's then transmitting that up to the U.S. Geological Service's uh, web, uh, satellites, and then they maintain that data for us. Every 10 years, we're going through uh, and monitoring the uh, water quality at the wells, and uh, that'll allow us to track water quality changes over time. And if we identify water quality uh, trends, then we can change our behavior uh, before it becomes too big of a problem. And Amy will be talking more about the monitoring well network and the uh, water quality studies in her presentation. So we also worked with the Illinois State Geological Survey to do a uh, geologic modeling of our subsurface geology. So three-dimensional modeling of our subsurface geology and aquifers. And so with their models, we can look at any point in the county and uh, identify uh, where the aquifers are, what the recharge areas are, uh, the interconnectedness of the aquifers. So on the profile view here, the lighter colors, the yellows, the browns, and golds, uh, those are our groundwater aquifers, our sand and gravel aquifers. The darker colors, the blues, the greens, the dark uh, uh, pinks, those are areas that are less permeable. So the silts and clays, those uh, confining layers or uh, uh, aquitards. And so we can see where the uh, aquifers are, where the recharge areas are, and we can utilize this for planning purposes. We also use the data from the three-dimensional model to recreate our sensitive aquifer recharge areas map. So this map shows where there is a strong connection between the land surface and the various aquifers that we have. So it's identifying those areas that have the highest potential for groundwater recharge and groundwater pollution. So with a single map, you're able to quickly identify whether your property or your project area is in or out of a sensitive aquifer recharge area. And our McHenry County Division of Transportation has long been a leader in sensible salting. And so this is uh, where you're trying to maintain public safety while releasing less and less chlorides into the environment. So when we're using salt or other de-icers, we're using uh, chloride mixtures. And the chloride, once it gets into water, cannot be removed. So what it happens is it just continues to accumulate in greater, greater levels. And it really is causing a problem uh, nationwide. Starting with the Water Resources Action Plan, uh, the Division of Transportation and uh, Department of Planning and Development have been holding sensitive salting workshops every year. And we've trained over 1,000 people in sensitive salting uh, methods. Uh, the uh, MCDOT has also become a leader in implementing sensible salting practices. And that often uh, involves using liquids instead of solid uh, salts and de-icers. Uh, the liquids are actually much more effective. Once you put it down, it's effective immediately. The solid material actually has to get wet before it starts uh, melting ice. 
uh, the liquids start working right away. And so we use liquids for anti-icing before storms and de-icing during storms. And a great project uh, that's underway right now is a combined effort uh, with the uh, D Division of Transportation and the Environmental Defenders of McHenry County. And so this is a uh, project where we're installing stream and watershed signs at crossings throughout the county. Uh, so the defenders came up with the idea of putting signs at the crossings, approached uh, McDot with that. Uh, they then coordinated to figure out where the sign locations would be and the design of the signs. Uh, the defenders then got a grant to pay for the signs. And now MCDOT is making the signs and installing them on all the crossings on county roads throughout the county. So you're going to start seeing these signs all over the place. And you, um, each of the signs are representing one of the two watersheds in the county. So all of our water bodies flow either to the Kishwaukee River watershed or to the Fox River watershed. So the top of the signs show the stream that is being crossed over. So Coon Creek, uh, Rush Creek, Nipperson Creek, and then the watershed below that. So throughout the county, you're going to have a much better idea of where you are, where the water is going to, and have a sense of place. And when people have a better sense of place, they're more likely to care about it and protect it. So the Water Resources Action Plan, uh, the original one, uh, a lot of great things came out of it. Uh, but the data in there and the report itself are well over 10 years old and needed to be updated. So the county board uh, tasked us uh, with the at the planning, Department of Planning and Development with updating the plan. And so to do this, we created a RAP task force. So the RAP task force was uh, uh, a volunteer group uh, consisting of just a very wide diversity of, of uh, stakeholders. So we had environmental groups, we had engineering firms, we had uh, public works and planning departments for municipalities, we had all uh, types of businesses represented. Uh, our gravel industry and aggregate uh, uh, folks were there at every meeting. We had realtor groups at every meeting. So people were really coming from all walks of life to participate. We had about 40 to 60 people at most of our meetings, and we would bring in guest speakers every month uh, to talk about uh, topics that they were experts in. Uh, we would then have charrettes and uh, discussions about the material that we covered and the draft chapters that were done. And the Water Resources Action Plan is now uh, designed to empower a diverse group of stakeholders uh, to conserve and protect water resources. And so the way the plan works is it identifies uh, the different land uses in the county, the different uh, threats to water resources under each of those land uses, and then best management practices that can be employed to mitigate the risk. Uh, so it's really about uh, identifying not just the problems, but providing solutions uh, to protect our water resources. The plan is uh, made up of 18 chapters that are broken up into four main sections. So section one is an introduction. Uh, it has an executive summary that explains why the RAP is important and how it was produced. Uh, and then it just provides general uh, overview of our environment, demographics, and land uses. Section two gets into our water resources and talks a lot about what we've talked about tonight. So chapter four focuses on general water resources. Chapter five delves more deeply into water resources specific to McHenry County. Uh, chapter six gets into water quality. So we have not only problems uh, from pollution uh, from man-made sources, uh, there are also some uh, naturally occurring pollutants that we need to be aware of and understand how we can prevent pollution and uh, address it when it does occur. And water conservation is one of the critical things for us to get a better handle on. Uh, our water supplies are not infinite. And uh, how we manage our water, how we use it, is going to make all the difference for current and future generations. Section three gets into major water issues. So these are issues that apply to water resources across the board. So it starts off in chapter eight talking about climate change. And we focus just on the, the basic mechanics of climate change and then the issues that we're going to be facing here in the uh, Illinois area. Uh, so we identify uh, potential opportunities to mitigate uh, the risk of climate change where we can avoid the worst of the worst impacts and then adapt to the changes that we can't avoid at this point. Uh, those changes include flooding. So we're getting greater and greater amounts of precipitation. Uh, and uh, that's going to continue into the future. Uh, but we're going to get it in fewer and fewer events. So that means that storm intensity is increasing. And so we're getting more and more rainfalls at single events. You know, a 100-year storm is now a storm. 
uh, and uh, we're getting more and more water when we don't need it and less and less water when we do need it. So we're going to have an extreme, uh, extremes of drought and flooding uh, that we're going to need to contend with. And one of the major tools that we're going to use to address all of these uh, issues is green infrastructure. And what green infrastructure refers to is utilizing natural systems, so prairies, uh, wetlands, uh, to uh, address our, our issues. So water that is passing through a vegetated area with native vegetation is uh, being allowed to slow down and infiltrate down in the ground, recharge our groundwater aquifers. It's uh, holding water that would otherwise cause flooding downstream and putting it back into the ground and recharging our aquifers. It's purifying water as it passes through. So green infrastructure really is going to be one of our most powerful tools to address all of the issues in the Water Resources Action Plan. And we're really going to need to get a better handle of how to design these and how to maintain them. So section four gets into land uses and best management practices. So chapter 12 focuses on residential and commercial development. Uh, and as we all know, uh, over the years, we've seen just exponential growth and urban sprawl occurring throughout not only our region, but the country and the planet. And uh, we really want to develop uh, healthy, productive and profitable communities, but not at the expense of our water resources. As we talked about before, water is necessary for all life. It's also necessary for all economic development. So if we're depleting our water resources or polluting them, we're not only hurting our uh, natural environment, we're hurting our economic environment too. So the two go hand in hand. So we look at smart growth pra uh, practices that can promote healthy communities uh, while protecting our water resources. So things like infill development, Development, focusing development in areas that are already built out and uh, have capacity and infrastructure, as opposed to building out in green fields where you have to put all new uh, hardscape material in, infrastructure in, and have greater and greater impacts. Uh, industrial development is chapter 13. Uh, industrial development is a very important part of our economic base. It provides job opportunities, economic development opportunities, but most industries uh, uh, handle uh, uh, toxic materials in one form or another. And uh, if they're handled properly, they can be uh, done, handled safely. Uh, but there are best management practices that need to be implemented. And these aren't things that can be just checked off in a box. It's not just writing on a page or even just talk. These are things that need to be rigorously implemented. It involves training. Uh, you can't wait until you have a spill to learn how to do spill containment and cleanup. Uh, people need to be trained at, uh, uh, in, for industrial developments when the developments are going in. And so there are best, man best management practices for all forms of industrial development that can allow development to occur safely. Uh, our transportation systems, these are systems that are necessary for any modern society. But uh, the vehicles that go on the roads, the location of the roads, the way that they're managed, all can have uh, impacts on our water resources. So how we manage our roadways and right-of-ways really can make a big difference. So chapter 15 focuses on agriculture. And as you all know, we're largely an agricultural county. Agriculture is one of the most important land uses we have and uh, will be important uh, uh, for the county's future. Some of the practices we have nowadays uh, cause erosion and cause pollution with excess amounts of fertilizer and pesticides. So we focus on soil health as a way of addressing these issues. Uh, healthy soils are much better able to manage water. Uh, a healthy soil can absorb greater amounts of water, promote infiltration, store it uh, for when it's actually needed. And one of the ways to improve soil health is with cover crops. And you're planting vegetation uh, throughout the year so that there's a constant cover. Uh, and uh, it allows for uh, greater uh, protection from erosion. Uh, it provides greater resiliency from flooding and f uh, drought for farmers. Uh, so there are economic benefits as well as environmental benefits, but there are challenges to adapting to this new uh, form of agriculture. So we need to be able to find ways to provide the greatest amount of assistance to farmers that are willing to take the lead and uh, make this change. But without a doubt, focusing on soil health and improving the way we uh, manage our soils will have leaps and bound benefits for future generations. And then open space. Many of us are here because we enjoy the open spaces provided by McHenry County. Uh, the McHenry County Conservation District lands, the Land Conservancy properties, and even our own backyards. We've got a lot of open space and great natural habitats in the, in the uh, county. 
And these are more than just pretty places. Uh, all of our open spaces are providing a whole multitude of benefits, whether it's flood prevention, uh, groundwater infiltration, water quality benefits, wildlife habitat. Each of our open spaces are providing just a whole litany of benefits that usually are not recognized or valued, but are still very much part of our life and very much benefit every resident in the county. And so we talk more about how we can manage our open spaces and uh, benefit from them. Uh, recreation is another great thing. Uh, we really want to be promoting ecotourism in the county. Uh, and uh, uh, recreation such as canoeing and uh, boating and other things can be great. But boating can also be a way of transporting invasive species from one water, water body to the next. Uh, the lead in fishing and hunting uh, gear uh, can cause pollution and harm wildlife. So there are ways that we can ad uh, adapt our recreational practices to be more sustainable. And then golf courses. We've got a lot of golf courses in the county, and golf courses can use a lot of water uh, and uh, be a great source of uh, pollutants such as uh, pesticides and fertilizers. But there are ways to manage golf courses to be much more sustainable, and so we talk more about how golf courses can be uh, adapted and uh, uh, be sources of benefits as opposed to uh, problems. And this is intended to be a very usable document. Uh, it's a big document. We've got over 420 pages, uh, but uh, we provide a lot of graphics. We really worked hard to integrate visual, uh, uh, visuals as well as information. Uh, so uh, a lot of these subjects are somewhat uh, complicated, and so we have uh, graphics to really help support that information. Uh, we have hired a professional editor to go through the document and then also uh, hired a professional graphic designer and publisher who's putting the uh, uh, final touches on the plan and uh, uh, it is now available online. Uh, we are going to be publishing about, uh, printing about 100 copies of the plan. Like I said, it's a big plan so we can't have an infinite number of copies made, but it is online and we have it broken out by chapter. Uh, so that you can go specifically to the places that you're most interested in. And we really want this to be something that is widely used and, uh, and benefits the county. So the next step is implementing the wrap. And so we're going to work with municipalities to adapt or adopt the wrap for their own purposes. Uh, we want to increase collaboration between municipalities and other organizations. And then we really want to increase data sharing uh, between municipalities and the Illinois State Water Survey and the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, Daniel Abrams uh, with the Illinois State Water Survey is going to be talking about data sharing and the importance of that uh, in his presentation. But the more information that we're able to provide, the better their models will be. And the better their models are, the better resource that we have uh, uh, to plan from, and the less need we have to reinvent the wheel from community to community. So we really can benefit economically as well as uh, from an information basis as uh, we start to share greater and greater amounts of data. Uh, we really want to be providing uh, presentations. So each of the topics that we've talked about tonight, uh, each of the chapters, we can be providing uh, specialized presentations to municipalities, organizations, conferences, homeowners associations, schools and classes, uh, or you know even for uh, uh, churches, uh, libraries. So if you are interested in uh, presentations for your organization, uh, please contact me and we'll figure something out. And we really want people to understand the online resources that we have. So the three-dimensional modeling, there is an online interactive website that is uh, uh, developed by the Illinois State Geological Survey. It's really easy to use, and it just provides tremendous information. And it's actually a lot of fun just to kind of figure out how to work it and to look across the geology of the county. So I highly recommend people get familiar with this and that municipalities start utilizing this for planning purposes. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey's uh, monitoring well uh, uh, website. Uh, this is something that everybody should be looking at. Uh, it's very easy to use. It provides data that's of interest to us all. Right now we're in a drought, and you can go on and just quickly look and see where the drought is occurring. And uh, then also we can download that data and use that for planning purposes. And then we'll work with communities and other organizations to help find grants uh, to fund uh, the initiatives that we talk about in the wrap. So just closing thoughts, uh, water is necessary for all life. 
Water is necessary for all economic development. What we have here in McHenry County really is pretty special and it deserves to be protected. And I really appreciate your time. Uh, if you do have questions after the uh, Q&A period, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by email. I work for you guys. Uh, I care very deeply about water resources and I'm happy to share my knowledge and experience with you guys. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight and have a great evening.